Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Masterclass. I'm Robin Young, the publisher of Orthopedics This Week. We're going to try something new this week. We're actually going to go on site at one of the major clinical centers in the United States. We're at the UConn. That is not north of Fairbanks in Alaska. We're referring specifically to the University of Connecticut Health Center. We're at the Musculoskeletal Center here. UConn made a strategic decision about two years ago to bring in an augmented reality system. This whole category of technology, augmented reality, is really exploding on the scene. Before healthcare, augmented reality had established itself in other areas. It's now a $25 billion industry in areas like gaming. But as the technology has evolved and grown and as the computing power has, has increased, it's moved into healthcare and has had an impact in the surgery, in the operating rooms, and for the institutions that, are, that uh, decide to acquire it. So today, we're going to have the opportunity to speak with both a surgeon that has brought in augmented reality, that would be Dr. Moss, and we're including the Vice President of Business Development for UConn, which is Chris Hires, and we're going to get both the clinical perspective on using augmented reality as a way to build community awareness and do more, as well as how the decisions are made in a shared decision kind of model. I know I'm going to have a lot of questions. I am sure you will too. So after we see the demonstration, we're going to go talk to them live and ask a lot of questions. You also are, can participate, make frequent use of that Q&A button. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be one of our most interesting master classes yet. So thank you. And here we go. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's Robin Young. I am in the uh, Gosling Library at the Yukon Musculoskeletal Institute. And joining me is uh, Dr. Isaac Moss, who has uh, been working with an augmented reality system for a little while, and Chris Hires, who's Vice President of Business Development. So before we get started, I want to remind everybody to please use that Q&A button, send in your questions. And uh, I've got a lot of questions right now for uh, Dr. Moss and for Chris. And w just to get started, I, I wonder if you two would each introduce yourselves, starting with you, Dr. Moss. Sure, thank you. First of all, thanks for having us, and it's great to be here. Uh, so my name is Isaac Moss. I'm a spine surgeon. I've been in practice now for about 12 years here at the University of Connecticut. Um, I have a practice that ranges from minimally invasive surgery to kind of big, open deformity and tumor type surgery. Um, on the side, as a hobby, I also am the chair of the orthopedic department. Uh, so we run a, a, a large department of multi-specialty orthopedic surgeons. Uh, I also co-direct our spine center, which is in conjunction with our neurosurgeons. Um, and I'm also the program director of our spine fellowship. So training orthopedic surgeons to be, uh, to be spine surgeons in the future. Well, I have to say, I know UConn has really developed quite a lot since you came here. And it's now recognized, particularly with all the research that you're doing uh, uh, all over the United States. Chris, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and then uh, about this institution. Awesome, thanks, and welcome to Thank uh, you. welcome to UConn, Robin, otherwise known as the basketball capital of the world. I have uh, heard. I yeah, have heard. it's true. Um, and basketball and spine surgery, apparently. Yeah, exactly. I was uh, neck and neck. Took, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Nice, we're yeah, we're just balancing those two. Yeah, we got banners in both. So, yes. so I'm Chris Hires. Uh, I lead uh, strategy and business development for the entity we call UConn Health. It's the health part of the University of Connecticut. Um, we are the state's flagship tertiary medical center. So while we're small for an academic medical center, there's 234 beds here on the campus in Farmington. We have a, a reach across all of Connecticut, and really across all of New England. If, if you've never been here, we're situated between New York and Boston. So you can really draw a circle that, that wide. Uh, a lot of our uh, tertiary specialties, like spine, like some of the other things that Isaac and his uh, colleagues do, draw from all over the place. We serve um, about 10,000 inpatients every year and over a million and a half patient visits to this campus each year. You've, you've been here, you've seen, we're, we do have the best physical campus in America. We're built up on a hill, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. And um, we think that we are uniquely positioned because we are big enough to do the kind of work that Isaac talked about, small enough to be really nimble and make things like what we're talking about today happen. You're in a highly competitive area. You've got oh. you've got Mass General north of you. You've got HSS and Rothman south of you. I mean, you're uh, you're in a tough market. Who are those guys? No, it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The comp, you know, it's funny because 
all of my colleagues would tell you competition is fierce, right? Not everybody has a quick drive to New York or Boston as their competition. We have, I think it's four hospitals within seven miles of us, uh, three of which are substantially bigger. It is a highly, highly competitive market for, for densely populated. And there's a, another academic institution down on the coast somewhere just an hour away. So us carving a niche that is uniquely Yukon Health is, is challenging, right? Because we are, we punch above our weight class regularly. And so looking for creative ways to take the good works of our docs and tell our story is always a priority for the leadership of this institution. Well, it's, uh, it, and it's, and you know, it, coming here is my first time here. It is an extraordinarily impressive institution. And all the work that you have done, Dr. Moss, is, is equally, I was stuck in the, in the hallway reading the posters outstanding work you're doing here. So uh, I understand you are chair of orthopedics, spine, yes. and, and, and the whole department. Yeah, the whole department. Um, and uh, you've worked on service line strategy plans and ideas. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about those plans and, uh, and how they are working out? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as Chris said, we are in a way, although an academic center, we're a small mm -hmm. center. And um, what we've tried to done then it do in, in the various service lines is see what can we do, what is the value we can bring to our population in Connecticut? How can we do that in a unique way that is different than some of the big players? Um, so the, what we're talking about today is, is spine. And uh, that's one, again, so the thing I'm most proud of probably because it's, I've seen huge growth since I've been here over the past 12 years, really going from two spine surgeons to six mm -hmm. from a program that was really not on the map to one that I think has some recognition at this time. And we've done that by kind of just slow and steady, right? Uh, getting first the right people, right? Recruiting surgeons that we know we can work together that are gonna do good work for the right reasons for our patients. Um, and then looking at in the world of spine, which is very technology based, as you know, mm -hmm. um, what are the right technologies that we can bring that will um, not just have, you know, uh, advertisement value or marketing value, but what is actually bringing value to us as surgeons and to our patients. Uh, we were the first uh, institution in New England to have a robotic spine surgery. So the old Mazor robot was something that uh, we had uh, several years ago and used. And again, Yes, it was nice for marketing, but it also brought a value to our patients in terms of things that we could do with that robot that we weren't able to do before in the same way. So we, we do look to make our investments, and luckily I have a great partner in Chris and with the rest of the institution yeah. to say, um, look at the individual service lines, look at the needs of the docs, look at the needs of the patients, see where those things coincide, and then be able to move forward to grow. And, uh, and think about it this way. Everybody's bigger. So our strategy can't be simply outspend them outrun them, out office them. Everybody's bigger. So leveraging what is uniquely yours, right? The passion, the talent, the energy, and placing smart bets is the strategy for this organization. And we were lucky when you know, Isaac became chair that he wanted to reflect on through each of his divisions, what do we do well? And it wasn't just coming to administration saying, here, I need $50 million to go build something. Here's how we can leverage who we are and what we are to be something that is far above our weight class. And build on your strengths. Build on what you do best. You know, but it, it's, it's hard for institutions to align that between what you would refer to as administration and the medical staff, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're used to this dynamic, at least the a lot of the folks that are probably watching are, where physicians will sit in a room like this and come back and we, we want to buy this new toy, right? Mm -hmm. Out of context. And I say, maybe the best thing ever for patient care. Mm -hmm. What? He did, and we did, because he let me participate with him, is sit down and say, here's some of the things we might do. We can develop these personal partnerships because of the size of the institution that we're in, and then really make those, and, and also just being realistic is what, what do we have as resources? And they may not be the same as the gigantic uh, gorilla down the street, but if we take the resources we have and invest them properly, we can really push ourselves forward in a way that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Dr. Moss, tell us a bit more about your spine practice, and you said you were the first to bring in a Mazor robot. As you bring in these kinds of enabling technologies, how do you incorporate them in your practice? How do you bring the other guys with you? Uh, yeah. How do you do this? All good questions, and I think, and again, and, and you'll see the theme, it comes down to really being on the same page and being a team, right? So 
as I said, we are six, uh, six spine surgeons, the 10 of you count, at least maybe six and a half. Um, um, but, and it's a comprehensive spine center. So our neurosurgeons and our orthopedic spine surgeons, we see patients in the same location. We have conferences together. We work together in the operating room. And this was something um, that really has been a push from almost before I got here to saying this is the best way to provide care for our patients. So it starts from there. And within the, the, the division or within the Comprehensive Spine Center, we each have our own areas of expertise. Mine may be a little bit more minimally invasively bent, but and there are some that are doing more of the larger deformities and some that are doing a little bit of everything. Um, but we, we kind of put together a team and then made it sure that it's an environment where everybody does work together. Um, everybody understands what our larger goal is and then how we can get that. The reason that's important is when it comes to things like enabling technology, uh, which do do need an investment, right? If me uh, and then and maybe one of my colleagues went to Chris and said we need to do this, and then two of my other colleagues said, oh, we need something else, and uh, three of our other, then w nobody gets anything. But that's what makes our job so great when that happens. So we appreciate <laughs> when they come on one page. No, so, and and so really the the foundation is be on the same page, understand our goals here, and then we can sit together in a room, which is sadly kind of rare, right? Where you can get people from different specialties together and saying, okay, well, where is this? How are we gonna push ourselves forward as a department? Dr. Miles, how did you find your way to augmented reality uh, technology? Yeah, so it's a funny, partially funny story. So um, um, one of my, so there was a time where actually a robot was aging out, number one. Mm -hmm. So there was a need there. We said, we, we saw the value of having enabling technology in our operating room for the complex things we were doing. Uh, the robot was aging out, so we needed to move on to something else. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big market, right? There's a lot of things out there. Um, I was lucky enough to have a mentor in life, Frank Phillips, mm -hmm. who uh, was, uh, is at Rush and where I did my fellowship. And uh, I was at a meeting and he basically pushed me at the uh, augmented reality table. He says, you gotta go talk to those guys. Um, I had known about them before, but it had been a while. And um, his endorsement, first of all, someone who uses it and speaks a lot about it and as someone who I trust uh, was uh, obviously meant a lot. And uh, then that allowed me to sit down at that table and talk to the folks at the company um, and understand where they were going with this. And it was really something very, very different. Now navigation, and we'll, talk, we'll get into it a little mm -hmm. bit in terms of the nuts and bolts, but mm -hmm. navigation has been around for a long time. And the essential technology of how the navigation works is not that different. But putting on that headset and, um, and seeing how it works, there's something that just takes it from this abstract thing on a screen to living an immersive technology, which is the definition, I think, of augmented Correct. reality. Exactly right. And it made it, and it worked. Funnily enough, a couple of months later, I'm sitting in a conference room down the hall when they were coming and giving me a pitch. And uh, this is kind of serendipity, I guess. Uh, my next meeting was with Chris. And um, this, was, this was a few years ago. And uh, finishing up, and I said, Chris, yeah. you gotta see this. I walk into a conference room where he's yeah, and I said, put on this headset. He did that, and you, there is a wow factor when you oh. put this thing on. I felt like and, I could do surging. I was like, I can see that. I can do that. And uh, calm down. Um, he hasn't let me try it. <laughs> but uh, safety first at UConn. Um, but, um, you know, he put that on, and I remember the line where he goes, if I could write the check, I would do it right now. The practicality of this is just the fact that it is intuitive. It's giving us the information you need. So, again, when you put on this headset, you're seeing the patient's CT scan projected. You're seeing a window into the patient's body. So I actually have x-ray vision. I was a huge Superman fan. This is the best I've ever gotten to having x-ray vision. I was very excited about it. But again, yeah, it's cool, mm -hmm. but it's actually very practical. And the big difference is your focus is on that patient 100% of the time. You're getting all this extra information that wouldn't be there. Normally I'd be looking up at a screen, look up, look down, look up, look down. That's mentally fatiguing. Mm -hmm. It takes you out of the zone of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It delays things. And it actually, there's a cognitive load mm -hmm. on the surgeon that mm -hmm. makes that a more difficult transition. When you put this headset on, everything is just there. Your brain wants it to work for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore you get all those advantages of high accuracy. Um, you can do more complicated things that you may not be able to do. You can understand anatomy of a patient in a way you never would have without ever looking away. Now this is a capital purchase. What was it like to go through that process of evaluating the capital purchase and go through, and could you walk us through that, that process of making a decision? Yeah, so everybody knows that these are multifactorial kind of, kind of discussions. And when you're a, um, 
a state-run academic medical center, we make everybody else's procurement process mm. look really easy. Mm. Um, it also came through at a time when we were on a financial upswing, but I would not consider this place flush with capital at the time. Right? And we, the way we did the deal in combination with another partner was something this organization had, had never, never done. And you know, I think about this, it was hard. It was, it was, they were anxious. It put years on my life because we were making the organization and, go. And this was place. actually a two-part capital purchase, right? Yeah. So in order to, in the current iteration, you need to have an ability to do an interoperative CT scan or somehow 3D image acquisition. Yep. That is a completely oh. separate technology than this. Oh. So we were actually looking at two capital purchases, oh. one to have the imaging capability in our operating room, and then two to have the augmented reality navigation. So it's even more complicated just saying, hey, buy me a headset. Right, but what helped the process was the unity on both. What I would refer to as both sides of the house, the ortho and the neuro. And conveniently enough, when when we were kind of hitting the wall, there was work to be done. It didn't look like we were going to get it done. Isaac was actually out of the country and had delegated one of his guys to work with me. And I probably talked to four of the six surgeons in half a day his absence, all of which were so excited, talked about Dr. Newton. I was like, there's more here than we think there is. And it made it worth the push, right? We'd seen with that previous robot that I think, you know, pound for pound, we're a pretty talented marketing communications firm in this way. We can tell a story and people see us credibly. So I knew we could get that mileage. And when you can think about it from the patient's side, right? That if you're in your home, seeing a story about these guys, that's a game changer because they're seen into you. Totally. So combining the what it could mean to growing the reputation of what we think is one of our finest services, but not always as loud out there as it could be, the step forward it could be in care and the creativity of the deal, it made all of the work worth it. So did did this purchase, this decision, this group decision that you make, what impact did that have for in terms of marketing, in terms of the partnerships, oh, in terms yeah. of... How did that all get leveraged? Oh, so we our return on investment on the non-operative side was tremendous. Um, the legs it got through the news team, through the social media, over and over and over again, uh, the views, the clicks, the activity to the website, all because we're out there talking about doing something different. And the team is really good at taking a repackaging and repurposing and moving this along in different ways. And so I bet we, we milked it for a good nine months. It wasn't just a one done splash. I'd see it again, but thousands of impressions, hundreds of thousands of impressions with the clicks. And what you can see is the activity to our website. So one of the things, you know, how do you know a consumer is checking you out, right? Well, when suddenly that's there and you can see them link through to the service and we start seeing it, their volumes, oh, these guys always are in demand. But what you can see the activity, that, that ROI was as good as any we had. What was the learning curve like after you after you got the system in? Yeah, so this I think one of the for when you talk about the intuitiveness, the learning curve within a few cases you're up and running. I mean, it's really um, compared to the robot, which I say, uh, which is just there's a lot more technical parts to it. That took me, I, I mean, I could put a number on it, but it's you know it's like probably 20, 30 cases before you're like really slick at it. Mm -hmm. This one, less than ten. And all of a sudden, it's part of your workflow, and it's that intuitive. Yeah. It was impressively fast for these guys. And you were saying you've you've done in total about four hundred cases. So today, for example, you have how many systems? You have one system or two? So we have two navigation systems and uh, eight headsets. So today, this week, how much are they being used? Daily. I mean, they're being used. Um, I'm using it, I have a case, I'll be using it tomorrow. Uh, it was used on Monday by Dr. Amuke. So we use it, uh, we have, we run at least one or two spine rooms every day. And I would say uh, there's almost not a day it doesn't get used. Okay, so 25, 30, 35 a month kind of thing. Yeah. So I, yeah. Especially once we've been ramped up. I guess that's why I was a little slower to get Guinea and then now getting to that point where it's just, it's, they're in, they're in constant use. Uh, we keep people, uh, we keep, we have a, we have a great uh, 
um, specialist or sales rep, as they call it, that is Brendan, who just keeps us, we keep him very, very busy to the point in where they have to bring in second and third people sometimes just to support the cases. And they provide good information to us so we see what's happening, which, is, which has been important. You know, so often you make a big, physicians will come to you, you'll make some big purchase, and then everyone in the administration is talking about why is that thing sitting around with dust on the boat anchor yeah. six months later? Yeah. This is not that. Right. This, is, this yeah. has been just tremendous. And that's the other thing where we've, uh, both on the company side, but also just getting together is we've had kind of quarterly or at least bi-annual meetings saying, okay, where are we at? Mm -hmm. Is this being used the way we want it to, want it to use? Are we so, getting an ROI? So just to kind of summarize a couple key points here. So when your robotic system was aging, you started to look around and, and Frank Phillips pulled in and kind of showed you what he liked. You've tried it. It's worked well. The ROI has been outstanding on multiple levels, yep. not just in hard terms and of soft ROI. hard and soft. And the soft is really important. Again, we go to that competitive environment that you exist in yep. and getting all of all that information out, getting the excitement out there. I think the way to be successful, though, is you approach it from what are the needs of you, your institution, your patients. Uh, I think that has to be where we start the conversation. Once we can establish that, then you go out to the different systems and understand, okay, well, how is this gonna fit into my, into my needs? For us, another robot purchase didn't seem um, to do what I needed it to do. Robots right now are very expensive drill guides. Uh, they, can, they can aim, uh, not much else, right? A navigation system, though, can show you where you are. So yes, it helps you put in screws, but it can also help doing complex decompression work. It can help you uh, understand anatomy for if you're doing a, a corpectomy or moving a bone from somebody. Where are you in this person's spine? That's something a robot doesn't really allow you to do. Yeah. But having the navigation or augmented reality to see this as you're doing it, where you are, that was important to us. And that's why, uh, amongst other things, we went this way. And think, think about the message to the community that you want who's bringing their care to you, right? Mm -hmm. A robot is a high is a screw placer, I think is how I did put it. Augmented reality, when you show them, and you'll see, I think you're gonna get tested and see, mm -hmm. right? It tells you that the person you're investing in, the, the surgeon, is making that better. And that's what the consumer wants to play. They're putting their trust in his hands, and this makes his hands So you're making better. the surgeon better. Right, and to me, that is the game changer. To the, My mom didn't to think customer. that was possible, just so you know, but. <laughs> yeah, we sent a note to her. Yeah. You know, it's, but, but the, um, no, but it is interesting, right? So you're making uh, the surgeries better, you're making the surgeon better, and um, and again, it's in a very yeah. consumable way. I mean, people can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting when I started doing robotics. I thought every patient would be extremely excited. They're like, "Oh, you have a robot! They're going to be we're well, sign me up." The, the patients would sometimes, like, "You're still doing the surgery, right?" Like, there's this kind of like Terminator, you know, uh, "Are the robots going to take us over?" type of thing. And there is a bit of a hesitation in the community. Now, again, we, we explained that they're enabling technologies, they're not removing from what we do. Um, but uh, I always thought that was a very funny reaction, something I hadn't anticipated from people. The augmented reality, though, to Chris's point, is something that makes a lot of sense to people. They can understand how this is keeping it, the surgery in your hands, the person that you trust, that you saw, that you met, that's a human, um, but enabling them perhaps to do things in a better way. And, and again, I'm gonna come back to the word comprehensive. I think your point is really good. You're moving from what you perceive to be a screw placing robot to a, a system that's more comprehensive that makes you a better surgeon in a variety of, of cases, in a, a variety of situations. Now I'd also make a, another final point. Augmented reality outside of medicine is a $28 billion industry. So many of your patients already know what augmented reality is all about. Them, right? yeah. and, and if you're posting on social media, I'm sure that'll get traction. Right. They have The only robot they have at home might be a vacuum cleaner, oh. but augmented reality, they're seeing everything. A vacuum That's cleaner a that will work sometimes, okay. sometimes vacuum your cat, sometimes do other right. things. But you, you get the, the, the adoptability to a consumer that says, this is my doc doing something, I think just cannot be undervalued. So um, I guess just bring it to a conclusion. I know we're gonna get some questions from our audience here shortly, but um, in terms of patient outcomes, and maybe it's not quantifiable, but perhaps you can speak to bringing in these enabling technologies. How's that, how's that translated into outcomes? That's a, actually a difficult question to yeah. answer. Um, I would say um, without it, we had good outcomes. 
mm -hmm. right? We did we did good work. I think we have like as Chris has said, and, and I'll say we have we have a bunch of talented surgeons that do the right thing for their patients. Um, what the so I think it would be difficult to say there's a gigantic change in the outcome of any particular surgery. It's, it's I don't know that our outcome measures are granular enough to make that determination. Um, but we are seeing is a few things. Number one, it allows us to take on cases perhaps we wouldn't have done otherwise, mm -hmm. especially in my case, who loved to do things as less invasive as possible. You know what, I'm not comfortable, I, I didn't even open that patient because I just wanna do a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, this case, I can say, you know what, I can do this in M MIS way because um, of the enabling technology, which I think is better. These are very, oh, I mean, as course. you know, MIS surgery is very hard to measure the benefit of that. Um, but to me, that's an intuitive benefit mm -hmm. that even if it doesn't come out on a, on a, on a spreadsheet, there's a benefit to that. Well, less patient. blood loss, hopefully less tissue damage. All those all things, those but things. again, those aren't don't always unfortunately don't forward as well as you would like on a mm -hmm. patient reported outcome questionnaire. But certainly, we know there's an advantage to that. Right. Um, it's very hard to measure efficiency, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the last kind of holy grail of a lot of a lot of these enabling tech, uh, which is difficult to study, is your fatigue, surgeon oh, of fatigue, course. right? This allows my my brain gets help doing certain parts of the operation, so then I can focus on some of the other parts of the operation that maybe need more of my brain. And hopefully with a lot less radiation. That is huge. First of all, I'll say thank you. Then I'm also gonna apologize because I'm going to try the system out and I don't wanna break it. Okay. I didn't, I don't think you can. They, if they trust me. Okay, gonna, all right. Well, gonna I'm gonna give it, a, give, it a, give it a shot here. Thank you for visiting us. It's been a pleasure to talk well, to you. And thank uh, you guys. hopefully thank others- you our story because we, you know, so many things you do don't turn out like you think. This turned out even better. I think it's an optimistic and hopeful story for people. You can take enabling technology. Dogs and cats can live together and do things that are good for the patient and the community. Dr. Moss, thank you very much for, for allowing me the, the opportunity to try this out. And, and next time you see Chris, apologize to him for having to take this out of the OR to, to do this now. But, yeah, no, it's I always, uh, it. listen, resources. We ought to always use our resources but wisely. I, I have never had a chance to try this, and after listening to you guys talk, especially after Chris's comment about he'd write a check right after he tried it out, I don't know if I'd do the same thing, but I'm really, I would like to see how this works. Great. So, um, a couple of things just about navigation in general, right? So, um, all navigation systems more or less work on the same principle. Mm -hmm. The principle is that a uh, scan has to be taken with a marker on the patient. So right over here, you see, this is a marker that is rigidly fixed to this patient's spine, okay? So that's number one. We do a scan with that marker rigidly fixed. That scan then gets transferred to a computer system. Now the computer system knows where the marker is and then can correlate that with a, any point on the image from that scan. Mm -hmm. Follow me so far? Yep. So then what we have is instruments that also have very similar markers on them. So now the computer system will know where the marker is attached to the patient, will know where the marker is on your uh, instrument, and then it's basic trigonometry, figuring out where the tip of my instrument is relative to the image that was there. And that's navigation in a nutshell. Um, specific to this is you're saying, how does the computer know where you are in, in the world, right? Um, in most navigation systems, there's some array of cameras that is somewhere in the, in the room that is looking at things. That's great, but it's also difficult because you get line of sight problems, people move their heads, there's, you know, an anesthesiologist gets uh, overzealous and wants to get in there or something. There's always things that can block it. What's cool about this system is that camera is actually built right into this headset. So your line of sight is what the computer is seeing and it gives, and again, I think that is what makes this such an intuitive system. The computer sees the same thing that you see and therefore can interpret information in the same way that you're oh, seeing it. That is incredible. So. Uh, you're going to try this on again. The headset's very simple. There's a camera, then there's these two lenses, which are which is the augmented reality, which is essentially two small computer screens that project right onto your eye. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also built in a headlight, which helps with surgery, other things like that. This is a wireless system, so there is a, a battery. But other than that, it's Wi-Fi, so you can you know walk around the operating room. You actually have a lot of freedom of oh, motion um, with this thing on, and you're not stuck in one place. So if you need to go in another side of the surgery. You need to do whatever you can do. You're not stuck in one position, um, kind of, um, you know, tethered to the table. So I think all those things is what, is what makes it pretty easy. It looks a little bit unwieldy, but once you put it on, it's actually pretty comfortable, um, and it does the job. So I'd have you put this on. All right. Actually, it, it looks a lot smaller than I expected it would be. I was 
Oh, okay, right. Okay, so. it's very comfortable, and again, it actually is pretty lightweight. And uh, oh my goodness, I can see inside the camera, guys. Oh my God. Oh, so. Yeah. Well, we're I'm gonna kidding. you're gonna you're gonna be writing a check after this, but it's not gonna be for the uh, for the system. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, first things first is uh, as a safety check, it want, even though we register. So what that means is we've already told the computer system what tools we're gonna use where the tip of this instrument is relative to this okay. marker. Okay. But again, safety being first, it wants to verify. So the first thing you're gonna do anytime you pick up a tool, is take this tool, okay. there is it, you put it in the divot, okay? You look at, oh, there you hear uh, so the so magical that, ding. So immediately I see tool okay in my, and I can see, I can see a vertebra right underneath right. here. So as soon as you, again, safety check to make sure everything is the way it should be. Yes. Now you're done with that. So now you come okay. off. And what you're going to see now that actually turned on the system before that right. there was you didn't see anything right? right except for maybe some words now when you look in you're seeing similar to what we see on the screen oh, you see yes. a axial and a sagittal CT yes. scan and probably the coolest part is that 3D circle that you're seeing in the middle absolutely and as I'm moving the instrument it's following my trajectory and I'm seeing Yes, it, it's really it's so you could fascinating. Tell, so if I could point out one piece of anatomy and say, hey, yes. there's that, you want to put... Spinous process, yeah. yeah I, let's I'll say just, you want to touch the spinous process with yes, this instrument. Exactly. You can do that right now. I did, exactly, I just did. And you yeah. can put it through, but here you don't see this, right? This patient, this is simulated skin. Right. Try to go through and touch it. Right. Push oh. through, push through, it's a needle. All right, oh, of course. It's orthopedics, you're supposed to push uh, hard. So you can go, 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 uh, go. Okay. Right? I'll yes. use the orthopedic surgeon in me <laughs> and find whatever piece of the bone you want to touch, right? Yes. So you can't see it in real life, but yes. you can see it in your headset yeah. and the, and you can see exactly where you are in real time. And wow. I think that's the big difference between this and some of the other systems. You're doing all this. You're not looking away. You're Correct. staring at the you're person. You're exactly. still concentrated exactly. on your surgery and the level of information and detail. What's really cool, look at the 3D model. If I love you look, it. I love look it. Look around. I love it. You oh, see yeah. a different view. Yes. You see up, you see down, you see around. And that's, I think, the uniqueness of this system, which for, and your brain wants this to work. And it's really three dimensional. So the two windows at the top are giving you what a traditional CT scan would give you. Right. Right. You're seeing slices through the patient's exactly. anatomy exactly. in order to see. Um, where the specific <laughs> points are. And then you're getting also kind of the gross yeah. rendering, the 3D model, which also gives you different information of where you are on the spine as a whole. So those two pieces of information allow you to do things um, without actually seeing. I Correct. can say, oh, this is a piece of lamina I want to remove. How do I feel it? How do I find that? And it can help me do these things. Yeah, it's not just about putting pedicle screws in. It's whatever the case is that you've got, whatever. It's, you it know. literally finds your way in Correct. the spine. It's the GPS. Right, that's telling you exactly where you need to be and how to get there. But it's more than just GPS. I mean, I'm actually seeing my instrument is being marked to the anatomy. Is it, so? Yeah. Yeah, and it, you can. I mean, you sort of so see that on the screen I mean, to a like, certain extent, like, right? Like still, that's your instrument. That's right. where it is relative to the spine, and you see this in a much more zoomed-in fashion than on the correct, screen itself. Correct. Correct. And then you're getting specific trajectories with the axial and sagittal type. So Terrific. very powerful, yeah. very easy to use. Terrific. And again, for someone yeah. who's never put this on, you've kind of got the hang of it already. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This is this is terrific. So I can hang on to this? Or yeah, do it's I have yours to, get, to keep. Do I have to give uh, it back? No, I think you can take that and uh, use well, it to drive home. No, this is fantastic. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Rob. Good job, guys. That was very good. And I have to say, I. Uh, it, seeing myself try the uh, headset on just brought it all back to me. It was wonderful. So, Chris, uh, I'd like to go back and, and circle back to something you said in your uh, in our in our discussion, uh, where you highlighted positive ROI on this project. And you, you know, you talked about community awareness. Can you elaborate a bit more on what you've done to augment? Excuse me, leverage. Uh, I actually should say augment augmentics. Uh, nice. navigation within the community and, and, yeah. and talk a bit about the results, Chris. Yeah, no problem. We wanted to make sure to get all the, the non-clinical revenue uh, benefit that we really pushed it through all the channels. And so you can see here a run of what is almost a year long of truly milking this from first cases using social media, using our podcast to actually landing these guys a prestigious spot in the, uh, in the, local business journal, which is an audience we very much wanted to cater to and other places on across again to uh, 
uh, Isaac's thing over there in March 6th. Were, we continued to repackage it, repurpose it in any number of ways because we want the consumer to see us in this space, Yukon Health in a leader space, to see our spine team out there as cutting edge and frankly, to click through and see us. And I think if you go back to that other slide, you can see that what we, we drove through a lot of the social media engagement, we then turned it into sponsored ads. I mean, we, we told the story enough, we ran it everywhere. They click through a lot and you see a, like a click through rate of 31% is terrific. I mean, we'll, we'll take, we take five to 10%. And this is just the highest performing ad. We had plenty of others that we ran oh, probably for the better part of nine months, really generating a lot of buzz in the market. And, uh, and frankly, I think crowding out anybody else that would have tried to tell a spine leadership story. So they're, they're nice examples. You know, we're lucky to have a good team that knows how to do this and the consumer really reacted to it. They were interested in, what can this do for us? And as you saw in the talk, Dr. Moss is awfully good at explaining it, as is his colleagues. So it was a marriage made in heaven. And as I said in our in our discussion earlier, your patient population already has a has an idea of what augmented reality is. It, you know, if they're a gamer or anything, they're using it pretty consistently. Uh, so patients noticing that you have augmented reality, and uh, if they are, how do you know? Well, yeah. I can mean, tell you, the first one is they click on this stuff and they check it out, exactly. right? They come on in, then they walk into Dr. Moss's office and they say. Yeah, so one of the most powerful points, right? They say, hey, are you going to do this? And one of the most powerful ads we had actually wasn't even advertisement. It was a it was a newspaper article. So one of our one of our patients um, did extremely well. He was very articulate and, and, and nice man and uh, told the story to the Hartford Current, which is our kind of local uh, main newspaper. And that was published on the front page. Um, yeah. And that, interestingly, that that one, in addition to all the other advertisement, but people were then walking in and asking about this technology, like like just straight out asking for it and saying, "Hey, are you going to use that on on my on my surgery?" Um, and uh, so that was, I, I think, two things. Again, uh, seeing that it's there and the recognition that augmented reality um, is. Uh, it is something that that uh, is out there in the market in other spaces, as you said, Robin. Um, it's something very relatable to patients, and uh, then uh, hearing a patient, uh, actually a patient story, uh, who uh, had surgery using technology and had a great outcome, uh, certainly um, uh, really seemed to be very powerful uh, for uh, our patients. Um, and uh, and they ask about it. So that's how we know, because they literally walk into the office well, and say, hey. I'd, I'd give you one more piece, too. To... There's a lot yeah, of positive sure. comments ahead, in the Chris. social media stuff, saying the social media stuff followed a lot of positive comments. People um, invoking the name of, you know, Moss, Melozzi, you know, Singh, Anuke, and go use these guys. So you could see that the customer, our public, accepted our expertise and then piled on with how great they were. It was nice. Well, it, 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 it just, uh, an analogy just popped in my head. You know, if I've got to put up a heavy mirror on my wall, if I had a pair of glasses that would let me see behind the wall so I wouldn't have to look for the stud, If you know, and I think every patient can understand this. If you could have x-ray vision through the wall, you knew where the stud was, so you put the nail in, it'd be exactly right every time. Um, it, yeah. It, anyway. I, I think, I think just, different... Just, Sorry, you know, I, I, again, exactly to, to your point, um, people have a hard time sometimes understanding what our technology is doing in medicine, right? We have a lot of, you know, try to get someone to explain what an MRI is and how magnets give you a picture. I was trying to explain it to my son the other day, very difficult. Uh, I'm certainly no expert in it. Um, but to your to your point, this is, even regular navigation, you know, it, it took me maybe in our, uh, in a few minutes ago, just to explain the process took several minutes. But when people hear, um, the word x-ray vision, they hear uh, augmented reality, they know what that is. They see it in their cars when they have a heads-up display. It's really no different. Um, they Patients, under people in general understand this technology. And so not only does it just sound cool uh, to say I can see through your body, um, but it's a very relatable thing. And, and I think people can understand um, how you're going to use this in their surgery. In a, it's a very easy, in a very relatable way. We all are on this digital train. We all know this, and I'm saying we. I'm including patients, all of us in 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 the in in the modern world. I guess we know we're on this digital train. We've been on it for a while. Our smartphones teach us every every new edition. We see something new that they do. 
and you have managed to be on this for healthcare, for spine surgery and orthopedics, on this digital train starting with uh, robotics, now augmented reality, it's going to keep moving. And you are positioning yourself as the guys who are riding riding this way quite well actually quite well and what i mean by that it's you're tying it directly to patient outcomes you're tying it to patient you know improving the care that you offer so chris and dr moss i'll start with you chris you're on this digital train how do you see this working for the future of your hospital uh the, these these burgeoning digital technologies like augmented reality from augmetics. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, so you're, I agree with your, um, we're on the train or the wave or whatever else. And I think there's a special place in academic medicine to be early adopters on those because as teachers and trainers, people can look to us and say, they're not just buying a toy, they, they're, they're embracing the science and moving forward. The hard part becomes, how do you make choices in limited budgets and everywhere else? And, and I think it goes back to something we, you know, we talked about in your tape section, when when the interests of the organization can align with groups that are really trying to move it forward, it starts to make the differentiation easier and faster. All your bets aren't going to be right. Um, but most of the time, if you're at the track and you do more good than evil, you get out and get to do it again, right? So I, I don't know how it plays next, but I know the consumer wants to see stuff, not just in the OR, but in their home, right? They want to get to the hospital at home, they want to get to more virtual monitoring, all these things. And I think um, it's it's going to it's going to make the next decade or so a lot of fun. Thanks, Dr. Moss. Yeah, and I think to build on that, um, and I, I really can't reiterate enough. I mean, we're we're very fortunate about I think the partners I have to work for in the surgery side. Uh, Hilary Ryan UK is the co-director of our spine center. Is a neurosurgeon I work for for the past, I work with sorry for the past decade. Sometimes I work for him too. Um, the um, and then uh, you, you know our other surgeons as well. Um, so we again I said that uh, previously, but we to get on the same page and and see where uh, technology can help us. Right. So uh, here not only does it enable more minimally invasive surgery, uh, it enables uh, difficult deformity surgery where. Where, where it's difficult to understand uh, patient anatomy, uh, even if it's an open case. Uh, it reduces our uh, our surgical team's radiation significantly, which again is a very big deal uh, um, for the uh, for our teams, for our health in the long this, run. Yeah. Um, you know, I would Absolutely. say I probably reduced our radiation to to uh, a third or less of, of what we were getting in the past. And uh, uh, to me, I guess for my own longevity, I think that's important and, and for our teams around us. Um, so you know, again, we always will approach the future of what are the needs that we have? Uh, what are the needs that our patients have? And again, I think surgical need for the surgeon, for the patients, for the hospital. Um, and um, and then I, I think if you if you approach it from that light, it's not about buying the next toy anymore. Uh, that's just going to be cool, right? It's about uh, buying uh, or it's about investing in a technology that's moving our care forward. Um, and, and you say the academic centers, actually, in, in fact, I think a lot of times active, active Academic centers are not always at the forefront because they're mm -hmm. difficult uh, bears to, to move forward. And, and that's another point. We're lucky in our institution at UConn, um, we're small enough where we, where we have these personal uh, connections and personal communications throughout the organization vertically and horizontally. And uh, so we're able to really uh, take a step back and make those strategic investments, uh, make those strategic decisions um, to move forward. Um, uh, with with whatever the next technology might be, uh, whether it's the upgrade of our augmentic system, which I know will get, uh, you know, that that headset, which actually is very comfortable, but is actually only getting better. Um, they've also um, augmented specifically has invested uh, some so in, into their um, segmentation software, so we can do more uh, with the information we're getting. And um, so there's only there's there you know there's there's what we can see. There's the computing behind it. There's so many there, there's so much that goes in to our surgeries now. And um, I think that technology and it's only getting better. And, and we're gonna be able to, again, have these nice conversations. You can, you can tell that Chris and I get along very well. Um, and uh, we, we can sit down and say, okay, where are we gonna, are gonna make our investments uh, for the institution, for our patients, for our surgeons? And, and one and, more uh, thought there as, as yeah. Isaac was saying that, I think the other part of the calculation is where does it help you differentiate in the market, right? If you, in our, in our case, we have a tremendous 
group of, of physician talent program in a market that has systems two and three th times our size and a people with longer, older reputations. And so our ability kind of virtually and literally to cut through and say, we're different, we're on the edge, we're going somewhere in a way that's relatable to the customer is really important. If you think about what we've done with other technology for 25 years that I've been in this business, sometimes we go out and tell a story that's totally not relatable to the customer, right? This they can relate to, right? And we're going to use, and before this meeting's over, patent your stud finder analogy and take that forward because I think people can totally see if you could do this, guess what they could do with that? It's really awesome. And your patients have choices and they're going to try to choose to go to a place that is at the leading edge of medicine. And if that, and that is, and you are making that case effectively for sure. Well, we're getting questions from our audience. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, actually, I'm going to, so here's what it's so, Was this system cheaper than your Missouri system? <laughs> Sorry. I don't recall. I believe Maybe the political correct answer is I don't recall. There you um, go. There in you general, go. Um, one of the advantages of the uh, Augmentic system in specific is it is, it is it is relatively affordable. All you need really is that headset um, and a laptop, right? And, and it works. Um, and as uh, we move, especially when people are looking at uh, moving these kinds of technologies into surgery centers, right? Surgery centers don't really have cap, like have huge capital in general. It's, it's not really in the model of a surgery center. This works, uh, you know, uh, the, obviously pricing changes, uh, you know, probably day to day, but uh, this is much cheaper than a robot um, and also much more portable. And, and because remember, we were talking about having that camera inside the headset, you don't need a big tower with you. Literally, it's a briefcase that has the headset and a laptop or a tablet and you're off to the races. Um, so yeah. is, uh, is I think, uh, one of the huge advantages of this particular technology, because I don't think we're going to see these big unwieldy robots in surgery centers. And that's where a lot of spine surgery is going. Absolutely. hundred percent. So, so Dr. Moss, to your colleagues who are thinking about augmented reality, I know Frank Phillips just pushed you at the augmentics desk and you were on your own. I know Frank, but, but you can advise other, your colleagues, right? What would you say to them about uh, augmented reality as a purchase, navigation as a purchase? So, I mean, I would say that uh, it, as um, these technologies are more available in general, enabling technologies, um, I don't know that it's the standard of care yet, but I would imagine that that becomes a standard of care at some point in the future. Um, so it's one of those things that, you know, either uh, get on the bus or uh, you'll probably be left behind. Um, and so it's a matter then of choosing, right? Um, and and then you have to see what makes sense for your system, for you. Um, it, to me, again, the, the advantage of augmented reality is the intuitiveness of it. It's the portability of it. It's the versatility of it, all the things that we talked about. Um, and right. um, and again, it's, it, and, and you know, you brought it up, but it's affordable. And uh, so I'm gonna, so, okay, spine versus neuro. I know we're walking into touchy area here. So who picked up on the system faster and is using it more, you know, uh, as it was intended? I know the, the, runner, they were the spine good. surgeon. So orthopedics, you're talking what? about a neurosurgery, right? I mean, it, honestly, uh, if you want my, my opinion on this, uh, yeah. or can yeah. candidly, Candid. uh, yes. candidly, I think this is going away, right? There, I, in my opinion, there are spine surgeons mm. Mm. and there's other mm. surgeons, good right? Point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, that's really been our philosophy at UConn for sure. And that's why we work together. Uh, that's why we see patients together. That's why we review cases together. That's why we do all these things. Because at the end of the day, sure, we have different backgrounds, but we're, we're working on the same body part um, or multiple body parts. And we have the same challenges. And so uh, to me, I think that distinction of ortho neuro, I mean, when, you know, you've been to some of our conferences, uh, it, it, I don't, I, I think it's, our, it's at this point in time, right. it's artificial. I think, right. I think you're absolutely right. And, and they both came yeah. to work immediately. They both jumped on it. There wasn't a, oh, we'll watch you and adopt. It was, so, they, were, they were all lined up. Absolutely. So I, I understand the concept, Dr. Moss, how this has helped expand your service line. That's a really great point. I hope everyone listening to this gets that. But were there, are there any cases where you would not want to use augmented reality? 
so there, there's a few considerations when it comes down to that. Um, I I firmly believe as a, as someone who's in education, right? I, I'm a, I have a fellowship. I'm training spine surgeons. Um, I don't want them to be, uh, and, and, and maybe the uh, industry behind this may not like that, but they can't be 100% dependent on any one technology. You still need to know how to do the surgery. Um, so in my practice, um, I, I there are cases uh, sort of the, you know, for me, a, a one level uh, minimal invasive fusion sometimes. Um, uh, I want my residents, I want my fellows to learn how to put in percutaneous screws on their own uh, with the old school fluoro method. Um, and so... I don't use them uh, for that reason, out of principle almost, because I feel like that's my responsibility as an educator um, to to uh, to not make them completely reliant. I, I would never want someone to have to not proceed with a surgery because the technology failed. And in fact, uh, early on, um, it might have been with another navigation system, but it, it kind of, uh, we, we had set it up and I was doing a case with a resident and, and the technology failed. And, and it's certainly the industry representative in the room were not very happy about that. They were kind of nervous. What would be my reaction? I said, oh, great. This is exactly proves my point. Let's go. And we're going to do this uh, the old yeah. school way. And, uh, and that was a great learning experience for the resident um, or, uh, that was with me. So I think, um, and, and, and again, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that I'm um, putting patients at risk or anything like that. This is some yeah. of the techniques I've used for years. So, um, uh, I think everyone has to decide where they are, uh, what their missions are. And again, one of our missions being education, I feel like there are cases, not that I couldn't use it. I think it would be useful for almost any case you're going to, you're going to put instrumentation in the spine, uh, this system will work. Um, but I pick and choose, uh, almost for other reasons. No, I couldn't agree. Uh, when I interviewed Lieberman at NYU, he said the same thing. Paul Anderson at university, university of Wisconsin brings all of his his surgeons who are learning to his wood shop to learn how to do, how to cut mm -hmm. in three, and be able to think three-dimensionally. So your point is right on the money. This These technologies will make surgeons and surgery better, for sure. But you can't, you have to know, you have to be a good, you have to be a solid surgeon, and then this moves you forward. Would you agree, Dr. Moss? I don't want to put words in your yeah, mouth. Yeah, no, I, 100%. That's why it's called an enabling technology. It's not a replacement technology. There you go. That's Dennis, it. Uh, I still have kids in mortgage, so it's not replacing us, uh, but it is um, it is enabling us to be uh, to do better th things and, and do different things. And I think this is going to be a basic a basic uh, technology in every uh, spine surgery center or every spine OR. I really do. Uh, eventually, what prompted the second augmented reality order? By the way, you've you've got two. Why did you buy a second one? Volume. Busy. You yeah. don't want to have to choose. Like I, you know, one one of the reasons we get along is because we don't have to fight over the system, right? Right. I mean, uh, 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 we're fortunate to have, uh, you know, again, uh, probably almost every day there's at least two. We're not a huge hospital, but uh, but we have two two spine rooms going, and uh, we don't want to have to uh, choose. Okay, this patient gets the, uh, you know, if if the, if there's a case that's appropriate, we want it available. And um, again, that goes towards the affordability of the system, honest, uh, candidly, and it also goes towards um, just uh, it was just it was just a, a volume decision, saying we we're using this uh, more than we can with one. And so again, I, I said, and we have a, we have a wonderful rep who's with us, uh, Brendan. He has to often bring in a colleague. Happened yesterday, uh, where there was uh, you know two of our uh, augmentics reps were there uh, because we had uh, two rooms using the system all day. So uh, it was very simple. It, we were using it. Yeah. It was getting used well. And then uh, that was, I think, um, an easy sell to Chris in his office. Yeah, it was exactly. Volume is king, man. If they got, you're going to tell me I can run two spine rooms at a time using it? Let's do it. I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm sitting exactly. here going, do I hear a knock on the door looking for the third? Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be waiting. No, no, no. No, no, no. You don't want to have a, you want to use everything all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the learning curve like, by the way? Minimal. Um, I mean, you put it on, you, you basically were able to put a, put a, almost put that needle in the right place. Um, there is something, yeah. um, very intuitive about it. And, um, it's, uh, you know, in a, within a few cases, it just gets into your workflow and, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really minimal. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I would imagine there's probably a study out there, uh, which I, I can't quote, unfortunately, but I'll just tell you from personal after two, three times, you're like, this, this is just working for you. And you, and you kind of, uh, when you don't have it, sometimes miss it. I can guarantee you these systems are going to get more powerful. 
They're going to be, they're going to give a lot more features, a lot more uh, uh, capabilities. It's just, you just know it, particularly with, you believe in Moore's Law, you know that's going to happen. So if you were to give advice to Augmetics, what would you like to see them do as their capability grows? And it will grow, I guarantee it. More powerful chips, more software. Where would you like to see them, you know, we're putting them on the spot here, but, you know, as we should, right? Um, what would you like so, to see I mean, them I, do? I, I think the only um, the only kind of uh, disadvantage uh, compared to other navigation systems are you either have to have the headset on or off right now, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's parts of your surgery, for instance, um, that you want to wear loop magnification for, you want to use a microscope for, you sort of have to say, okay, I'm done with my navigation part of my surgery right now. I'm going to take my headset off and I go to my second part of my surgery. Uh, what I believe is in the works, but I would love uh, would love to see is um, something that I can wear without throughout the surgery. I don't have to decide that I'm done now. I can come in and come out of it. I, uh, you know, built in uh, magnification, able to uh, not 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 have basically not having to decide to take it on or take it off. To have that uh, immersive augmented reality available um, and not available without me having to take off the physical headset. I, I think that would be a huge step forward um, because uh, again, it, it 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 will allow us to use it for more parts of the procedure. Guys, it's really only going to get better. I, I, I know that. Well, gentlemen uh, and our audience, first of all, Dr. Moss, Chris, thank you. You were, I, I learned so much from you guys. It was such a pleasure talking to you and uh, playing with the system myself. I, and Augmetics, thank you for, for sponsoring this meeting. You, you are doing great work, and this is just going to get better as time goes on. And to our audience, it's always great to have you join us for these master classes. Uh, this master class will be uh, recorded. Uh, we're going to be posting it on our YouTube channel, and I'm sure Augmetics will be posting it as well. Uh, I think this is one of our best master classes yet. Uh, I think everybody learned a lot, and uh, it's been terrific. So, with that, thank you all very much. Appreciate having you join our class. And look forward to seeing everybody at our next masterclass.